One of the neat things about Star Trek is how it has soaked so deeply into our broader popular culture that every once in a while, a piece of it will just randomly pop up, completely out of context, in something totally unrelated. Often this takes the form of a turn of phrase like, beam me up, Scotty, or she can't take any more, Captain, and hey, those are both Scotty-related lines, look at you, crossover superstar. And speaking of crossing over, sometimes the piece of Star Trek that turns up somewhere else is not a phrase, but an image, like this one, or this one, or this one. These are all identical villainous counterparts to protagonists, evil twins, if you will, and their evil status is telegraphed by the fact that they, unlike the good guys, have facial hair. Although, to be fair, Flexo here actually turns out to be the good guy. It's Bender who is the evil twin, but it's an inversion of the same trope, so I say it counts. All of these examples, and many more just like them, are inspired by this. Spock's goatee sporting double from the classic Star Trek episode Mirror Mirror. That episode not only introduced the evil doppelganger with facial hair trope, it was also Star Trek's first visit to what would be known as the Mirror Universe, a setting to which subsequent Star Trek shows and novels and comics have returned many, many times. But as we should all know by now, quantity does not equal quality. That being the case, I'm wondering, is Star Trek's Mirror Universe actually worth revisiting? Right off the bat, I think it's safe to say that Mirror Mirror is one of the most referenced episodes of Star Trek the original series, or any Star Trek series really, especially when the reference is part of a gag. That makes sense. Though the episode itself is not a comedy, it is one of the most delightfully absurd premises classic Trek ever presented. Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty are involved in a transporter accident that causes them to switch places with their counterparts from a parallel universe. A parallel universe where identical variants of our noble and selfless heroes are sneering, mass-murdering villains, and where in place of the benevolent and democratic federation, there is a brutal and militant empire. The foursome soon finds that life aboard this imperial enterprise is quite precarious. Officers gain promotions by assassinating their superiors. Discipline is enforced through the use of pain-giving devices called agonizers. And if you really fuck up, you get to spend some time in the agony booth. So, an agony-based correctional system. And the commanding officer has an official consort. The captain's woman. Suddenly Kirk's like, Maybe this place isn't so bad. I kid. Kirk's reputation as a wanton pussy hound is greatly exaggerated, as I've discussed in detail in past videos. He, like McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty, is primarily concerned with getting the hell out of there. But first, they've got to figure out where here is. So, after bluffing their way past Spock the Beatnik serial killer, they huddle up in sick bay. Everyone agrees that they felt dizzy when they were in the transporter beam, and Kirk remembers materializing briefly in the transporter room of their own Enterprise, then fading out and arriving here. The ship was caught in an ion storm during the beam out, so Scotty speculates that it affected the transporter somehow, causing them to materialize somewhere else. Then, employing the sort of impeccable intuitive logic Batman was using to solve riddles over on ABC at the time, Kirk reasons that they must have somehow been transported to a parallel universe and switched places with their counterparts from that universe who were also beaming up from the same place at the same time during an ion storm. They split up to familiarize themselves with the technology aboard this Enterprise. Kirk heads to the bridge, where he's expected to obliterate the Halkins, who have refused to provide dilithium crystals to the Empire. Kirk was leaving a negotiation with the Halkins in his own universe when the landing party beamed up. The Halkins on that side didn't want to play ball either, but Kirk wasn't going to retaliate by destroying their entire civilization, probably. On the bridge of the Mirror Enterprise, 
Kirk hails the Hulkin leader and gives him one more chance, 12 hours, to change his mind or everybody dies. Mirror Spock is like, that was suspiciously generous. Kirk, McCoy, and Scotty reconvene in Kirk's quarters. They talk to the computer to confirm what they already suspected. Scotty has an idea for how to use the transporter to cross back over to their own universe. Kirk wonders what their counterparts are doing right now. And then we get a brief cutaway to the Prime Universe, where the mirror versions of Kirk, McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty are being thrown in the brig by Spock who listens to Mirror Kirk rant and rave and attempt to bribe his way out of the cell, and then just walks away like, how about this shit? Long story short, with help from Captain's woman Marlena and Mirror Spock, who turns babyface to help Kirk and the others return to their own universe, because he'd rather have his own psychotic Kirk back than have to deal with this, oh, let's not commit mass murder fucking buzzkill, Kirk, McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty succeed in implementing Scotty's plan, and they beam back to the Prime Universe, swapping places once again with their mirror selves. Once everyone is back where they belong, Kirk and McCoy have some end-of-episode banter with Spock, who says he found their counterparts refreshing. I bet he loved having an excuse to toss McCoy in jail. And then Kirk meets the Prime Universe version of Marlena, the captain's woman, who on this side of the mirror is a lieutenant who has just been assigned to the Enterprise. Kirk turns to Spock and says, she seems nice and immediately begins flirting with her. So maybe that reputation isn't completely exaggerated. For the most part, Mirror Mirror isn't explicitly played for laughs, but it is a lot of fun. The thing is, though, it's kind of a one-note gag. The universe where everybody's evil! You can get an episode out of it, no problem, but does it have legs? Apparently, lots of Star Trek writers have thought so. While TV audiences wouldn't see the Mirror Universe again for over 25 years, readers of the comics only had to wait about 17. The eight-part Mirror Universe saga ran in DC Comics' monthly Star Trek series beginning in 1984. I actually talk at some length about the Mirror Universe saga in the previous video in this series, the one titled What Actually Happened Between Star Trek III and Star Trek IV, so I'm not going to repeat myself here. I will say eight issues is a little long for this story, but it's mostly fun and enjoyable, and unlike most of the other later Mirror Universe stories, it's a direct sequel to Mirror Mirror, albeit a belated one. Mirror Mirror ends with our Captain Kirk trying to convince the Mirror version of Spock that the violent, conquest-obsessed Empire is doomed to crumble. Kirk urges Beardo Spock to be a leader, to fight to reform the Empire into something more enlightened and logical. Van Dyke Spock promises to consider it, and then Kirk and the others return to the Prime Universe, and the episode is pretty much over after that. In the Mirror Universe saga, it turns out that Imperial Spock did consider it, briefly, and decided, nah, and continued being the evil first officer to the evil Captain Kirk. He eventually does turn against the Empire after a mind meld with Spock Prime, but before that happens, you can't really blame him for sticking with the Empire if he had turned against Mirror Kirk and the others sooner. Things might have gone a lot worse for him. In fact, things do go a lot worse for Mirror Spock in the next significant work to feature the Mirror Universe, Diane Duane's 1993 novel, Dark Mirror. It's probably the most well-known novel to deal with the Mirror Universe, but it's not the only one by a long shot. The Mirror Universe and people from it also figure prominently into three of the Star Trek novels written by William Shatner, Spectre, Dark Victory, and Preserver, which feature familiar faces behaving wildly out of character and numerous gratuitous appearances of characters from across the franchise. None of that has anything to do with the Mirror Universe. All Shatner's novels are like that. Back to Dark Mirror, 
The novel is set in the 24th century and centers on Captain Picard and the heroes of Star Trek The Next Generation facing off against their Mirror Universe counterparts. In this version's backstory, Mirror Spock does attempt to bring about reforms like the ones suggested by Prime Kirk, but he is soon executed for his trouble and the Empire continues on just as before. The crew of the Enterprise D discovers that their mirror universe equivalents have crossed over as part of an imperial scheme to invade the Prime Universe. So Picard, Geordi, and Troy sneak aboard the mirror Enterprise D and masquerade as their mirror versions in order to learn more about what the Empire is planning. As with Mirror Mirror and the Mirror Universe saga, some of this is fun. Diane Duane gets that the appeal of the Mirror Universe concept lies in getting to see the villainous alternate versions of familiar characters. Dark Mirror gives us a merciless Mirror Picard who knowingly sent his best friend Jack Crusher on a suicide mission and then claimed Jack's widow Beverly as his captain's woman. There's also Mirror Wesley, who wants to kill Mirror Picard in retribution for the death of his father. And there's the ambitious and two-faced Mirror version of Riker, who insists he supports Mirror Picard 100% while waiting for a chance to murder and replace the captain. But as Mirror Mirror and the Mirror Universe saga also demonstrate, Dark Mirror shows that this concept will only stretch so far before it becomes repetitive and kind of boring. Unfortunately, this held true once the Mirror Universe finally returned to TV as well, which it did in 1994 in an episode from Star Trek Deep Space Nine's second season titled Crossover. In this episode, Major Kira and Dr. Bashir have a little mishap while flying a runabout through the wormhole and find themselves aboard the Mirror Universe version of Deep Space Nine, or Terok Nor as it's still known on that side of the looking glass. Once there, they meet the mirror counterparts of their friends and colleagues, including the unremittingly horny mirror Kira, the grinning space pirate mirror Sisko, and the joyless authoritarian hard-ass mirror Odo. Hey, there's a twist on the formula. I guess not everyone's mirror version is different, huh? Crossover ignores the Mirror Universe saga and Dark Mirror and establishes its own backstory for what happened following the events of Mirror Mirror. In this version, Mirror Spock is actually successful in his campaign to reform the Empire. So successful that the Empire is eventually toppled by a klingon cardassian alliance. The alliance also includes Bajor, which explains why Mirror Kira gets to be an authority figure, and most of the humans are basically slaves. Just like Mirror Mirror, the plot of Crossover is driven by the efforts of our heroes to escape back to the Prime Universe. And just like Mirror Mirror, it's entertaining enough with some clever bits. I like how the writers of Crossover, Peter Allen Fields and Michael Piller, reshape the Mirror Universe to fit their series rather than trying to do a more direct follow-up to the original series episode. And I love how much fun the cast of Deep Space Nine is obviously having getting to play evil versions of their regular characters. Nana Visitor is a delight as the slinky femme fatale version of Kira, and Avery Brooks once again shows himself to be the most entertaining over actor in the entire Star Trek franchise, exuberantly chewing every square inch of scenery within his reach. But by the time it's over, you're ready for it to be over. Or I am, anyway. I remember watching this episode when it originally aired, for I am old, you see. Returning to the Mirror Universe on screen for the first time since the original series was cool. Watching the cast ham it up more than usual was a treat, but... I wouldn't exactly say I was emotionally invested in any of it. The episode relies on the gimmick, and it's not as if the outcome is ever in question. I know Kira and Bashir are going to make it back to the Prime Universe by the end. And as for what happens in the Mirror Universe after that? Who cares? It's a joke universe. It's been good for a laugh now and then. I've got nothing against it. But does anyone expect me to actually give a shit about it? The answer to that question is yes. 
Apparently, the creators of Deep Space Nine expected me and the rest of us in the audience to give a shit about it because they made four more Mirror Universe episodes in the next five years. Through the Looking Glass in Season 3, Shattered Mirror in Season 4, Resurrection in Season 6, and The Emperor's New Cloak in Season 7. Sprinkled throughout those four episodes are some really clever bits. Mirror Worf, when we meet him, is a hoot. When he really goes for it, Michael Dorn gives Avery Brooks a run for his money in the entertaining overacting department. And there's a funny running gag featuring the show's various Ferengi characters who turn out to be stand-up guys who stick their necks out to help people, only to wind up getting executed. The writers never lose sight of the goofiness of the Mirror Universe, which is good, but significant stretches of all of these episodes also rely on me being sincerely invested in the human-led rebellion against the Alliance, and I'm just not. I'll give the writers of the last DS9 Mirror Universe episode, The Emperor's New Cloak, credit for at least coming up with a somewhat inventive spin on the idea, combining it with another of their favorite tropes, the Ferengi episode, and having this crossover initiated intentionally by someone from the Prime Universe side, specifically Grand Nagus Zek, who travels to the Mirror Universe hoping to open it up as a new territory for Ferengi commerce. It is the deranged act of an unhinged capitalist and entirely in character for Zek, and the result is an infusion of much-needed comedic energy, and an episode that is less of a slog than I might have expected. By the end of Deep Space Nine, the Mirror Universe concept was threadbare, to put it mildly. Thankfully, the creators of Star Trek gave it a rest for a few years. There are no Mirror Universe episodes of Star Trek Voyager, and Star Trek Enterprise managed to delay its excursion into the Mirror Universe until its fourth and final season, when it broadcast the two-parter entitled In a Mirror Darkly. This episode sets itself apart from the other post-Mirror Mirror shows set in the Mirror Universe in a couple of ways. It's not a particularly good episode. I do find this one to be kind of a slog, to be honest, and dragging it out into a two-parter is downright perverse, but it's at least more interesting in concept than the Mirror Universe episodes on Deep Space Nine. For one thing, this is the first Mirror Universe episode not to feature any characters crossing over from the Prime Universe to the Mirror Universe or vice versa. The episode is set entirely in the Mirror Universe from beginning to end. They even whipped up a special Mirror Universe variation of the opening title sequence, which is cute. I appreciate the commitment to the bit. For another thing, it turns out the producers are only using the Mirror Universe gimmick as a convoluted excuse to shoot an episode on recreations of classic Trek sets and get the cast into TOS-era costumes. So. You start the episode expecting one kind of fan service, and then when you're not expecting it, BAM! They hit you from the other side with a completely different kind of fan service. Just like the ending of Buster Keaton's classic short One Week, where the house is missed by one train, only to be demolished an instant later by another one. Exactly like that. Except for all the important ways in which it's very different. And look, I don't enjoy blatant pandering fan service. You might say I'm not a supporter of it, but I do appreciate a good misdirection gag. Nicely done as far as that goes, people who made Star Trek Enterprise. As for the episode itself, eh. We follow the mirror versions of our heroes as they discover the TOS-era USS Defiant, which vanished into another universe in the classic Trek episode The Tholian Web. It turns out the Defiant wound up in the mirror universe and also went back in time. The ship has been captured by the Tholians of this universe, and Mirror Archer is determined to claim it for the Empire. There's some palace intrigue. Archer starts out as a commander under Captain Forrest, but seizes command in order to carry out the mission to Tholian space, and the usual hijinks involving the characters scheming and plotting and stabbing each other in the back. It's fun. Up to a point. 
There's also a Tholian and a Gorn, the first time either species has been seen on screen since the original series, and the novelty of seeing the Enterprise cast playing on TOS-era sets and TOS-era costumes, so if that does it for you, there you go. Personally, I find it pretty tedious. We're late in Season 4 of Enterprise at this point. My level of interest in the show has plunged. I barely care about the actual main characters. Now we spend two shows following alternate versions of those characters, doing stuff that has no bearing whatsoever on the rest of the series. Plus, it's a rehash of a one-note joke concept that has been done to death already. So... If that's how I feel about Enterprise's two-part Mirror Universe adventure, you can imagine how I feel about Star Trek Discovery's four-part Mirror Universe story arc in its first season. Look, I'm not trying to shit on Discovery here. I like Discovery, but that first season is rough. And one of the things that makes it rough is that it feels like the writers had no idea what show they wanted to do. They set up a war with the Klingons as a major story, and then the war mostly happens off screen and in the background. And then they spend four episodes, four episodes in the final third of a 15 episode season, screwing around in the mirror universe. They do at least come up with a premise that has some tension built into it. There's the big shocking twist that the mirror version of Giorgio is the Emperor, and the other big shocking twist that Captain Lorca has been from the mirror universe all along. The crew has to disguise themselves and the ship itself as their mirror universe counterparts, so it's kind of similar to the original mirror mirror scenario. It turns out the Mirror Universe version of Tilly is a notoriously brutal commanding officer nicknamed Captain Killy, which is good for a laugh or two, and it gives Tilly something to do, which is okay by me, because Tilly is one of my favorite characters in the show. We get to see some of the Mirror Universe counterparts of the Discovery crew members, and as usual in these episodes, the actors seem to be having fun, but the contrast between their regular characters and the Mirror counterparts doesn't land as well as it should because their regular characters have barely been established by this point. It's kind of difficult to laugh at how different the Mirror version is when you don't really have a sense of who the Prime version is. And did I mention this goes on for four episodes? There's a side story about Burnham being sent to destroy a colony of rebels, and it turns out Mirror Lorca has been plotting to overthrow Emperor Giorgio, and Burnham is having feelings about Emperor Giorgio because of the guilt she feels over the death of Prime Giorgio, and it's four episodes consisting mostly of interminable filler that holds little to no relevance to the rest of the season, but I should have had more faith in Discovery than that. Or maybe less faith? I don't know. Whichever one of those is the appropriate one. Because two years later, in season three, the show outdid itself by producing a two-part episode, Terra Firma, that takes place in the Mirror Universe, but in an alternate timeline created by the Guardian of Forever, making it the most pointless Mirror Universe episode to date, because not only are the events irrelevant to the Prime Universe, where the series is actually set, they're also irrelevant to the Mirror Universe. Two episodes of a 13-episode season spent jacking off in an alternate universe within an alternate universe. And the point of those two episodes wound up being Mirror Giorgio has become a slightly better person since she came to live in the Prime Universe. Time well spent. Glad we indulged in two more episodes worth of dead horse beating in order to establish that. Here's the problem. Like I said before, the Mirror Universe is a joke concept. It's shallow. It's silly. That's okay. But it's okay for one episode. If you go back for a second episode, or a third, or more, even if there are years and years between these episodes, to keep the concept fresh, you've got to do one of two things. You've got to find a new angle on the joke, or you've got to transition the concept from a joke into something else. But the writers of the many, many, many Mirror Universe episodes that have followed Mirror Mirror haven't really done either of those things. They've repeated the original joke, 
sometimes literally see the goatees sported by the mirror versions of Saval and Sarek, but they haven't really innovated. And they've tried to tell stories that elicit our sincere emotional investment while also maintaining the our universe but everything is evil joke, which is difficult to pull off, which is why they don't pull it off. Which is not to say I don't understand why some people, fans and creators alike, still find the Mirror Universe compelling. I don't share their feelings, but I see where they're coming from. I happen to think there are far too many episodes set in the Mirror Universe, 16 altogether, but at the same time, that's only 16 episodes out of over 850 in total across the franchise. Never mind the gimmick. The Mirror Universe itself, as a setting, is still more or less a blank slate relative to the rest of the story world, and if you're a writer working on Star Trek, it's a very attractive prospect to be able to sneak off into a corner and tell a story without having to reckon with all 55 plus years of accumulated canon, or the most pedantic members of the fanbase who are hyper-vigilant in their self-appointed guardianship of that canon. I still wish the writers wouldn't do it, because the results have not been super impressive, and the more they do it, the less impressive those results become. But I get it. So, is the Mirror Universe worth revisiting? Maybe once or twice? But we passed that marker more than 25 years ago. Enough already! With the exception of Crossover, Deep Space Nine's first Mirror Universe episode, which comes out looking relatively good because there was still some shred of novelty left in the concept, none of the episodes that followed Mirror Mirror have been strong enough on their own or important enough to the ongoing development of their characters or series to warrant watching more than once. To be completely honest, Mirror Mirror is fine, but it's hardly Star Trek at its finest, and it's the best Mirror Universe episode by far. I was ready to be done with the Mirror Universe altogether after Crossover. Regular viewers of my Trek videos know that Deep Space Nine is easily my favorite Star Trek series. The Mirror Universe episodes are some of the only DS9 episodes I am not only willing, but happy to skip. The Mirror Universe concept has been so thoroughly wrung out over the years that it's become one of the most glaring examples of Star Trek's recurring inability to just let shit go. At this point, I honestly can't think of a single reason to reprise the Mirror Universe gimmick other than sheer desperation in the face of total creative bankruptcy. Thank, Thank God, God I don't, I don't know, know what, what that feels, feels like. like. Ah! ah! What the, the hell, hell is this? this? Oh, oh, come, come on. on. What are you doing interrupting my video? Me? You're interrupting my video. I'm into... <laughs> Wait a second. I know what this is. Oh, you know what? So do I. Yeah. You're... you're... You go ahead. You're my ghost self from the false universe. Exactly. And you're my... Wait, what? We must have partially crossed over somehow, because we're making videos about the same thing at the same time. I'm over here, and you're over there in the false universe. I'm your ghost self from the false universe? What the hell is that? Well, it's just what we call it. It's a pretty messed up way of looking at it. Well, you gotta call it something. What do you call our universe? The mirror universe. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Right? We came up with a non-judgmental name for your side. Yeah, well, us do opposite. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Are you a Superman fan too? Nah, I hate that corny shit. Oh. Except the Zack Snyder movies. Those are amazing. That figures. I bet Zack Snyder has directed a whole bunch of Superman movies on your side, huh? Hell yeah, and I love every single one. I bet. So... They make me want to be a better person. So, I wonder what else we... don't have in common. Do you co-star on a Star Trek-themed improv comedy podcast? No. Okay, well... I'm the head writer for Star Trek Lower Decks. Really, is it funny on your side? Oh, it's hysterical. See, I can't tell if you're saying that because your version is actually funny, or if you just think it's funny. Either way, it's different. True. What else can we compare? What about personal stuff? Like what? Um, I had a dog as a child and a cat as an adult. 
What about you? That's so weird. I had a cat as a child and a dog as an adult. What was your cat's name? Star. <laughs> that was my dog's name. What was your dog's name? <laughs> you name your dogs? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think we're losing our connection. It must be because we're getting close to the end of the video. Yeah. Hey, listen, I know we got off to kind of a rough start, but I'm glad we had a chance to talk. Best of luck to you all on that side, okay? Same to you, man. Look after yourself. I will. Goodbye. Hail the Emperor. Emperor? Don't tell me on your side Trump got re-elected. I would not use the term elected. Mirror Steve. Oh, shit, I should have told him to grow a beard. I look so much better with facial hair. Hey, folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Brandy Lovato. Thanks, Brandy. And that's it. One new patron gets a shout out this month. Next, new channel members. And there's only one of those. Sean Collins, who just rejoined. Thank you, Sean. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the $5 five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. And now to next month's regulation Trek Actually topic. In last month's video, I got to examine a question that did have an answer. It's just that a lot of fans didn't know the answer because it came from 40-year-old comic books that most of you either didn't read or had forgotten about. In next month's video, I get to tackle another hypothetical question, a Star Trek what if. That question is, what if the Star Trek TNG crew had actually left the Enterprise. Because even once they got to the movies, they were all kind of frozen in place, weren't they? What if the creators had gone a different way? Let's speculate on that in a few weeks, shall we? I'll see you then, and a bunch of times before then. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody. <laughs>